I live in a small town where everyone knows everyone and everything. My sister and I adore film photography, so we were hopping from park to park just this past April to get shots of the spring foliage. My school is located in the middle of the woods just off of a residential area, and down an adjacent road is a beautiful, scenic, mountainous park of about 250 acres with various recreational sections, playgrounds, and also trails. I visited the park to read frequently in isolation, but it was always fairly empty. That day would be no exception, as it was overcast and rainy, and the previous, much more popular parks we visited were devoid of people. On the way to the park, I hit a light that essentially functioned as a stop sign. I lingered just a bit at this light because people tend to cut me off, and another car to my left stopped just a hair after mine. My blinker was on to make a right, and they had no blinker on, so we were going in the same direction. As we climbed the hill toward the park, I glanced in my rearview mirror to find the car hanging back at a snail's pace. A line of cars were jammed up behind it, and I remember questioning why this guy was going 25 to 30 miles per hour when the limit was 45. As the hill crested, I made a left into the park, and lo and behold, it was absolutely empty. Perfect. We passed approximately five parking lots with their respective playgrounds and soccer fields and trails, winding through the hilly terrain before we came upon the parking lot I typically parked in Redden. It was the prettiest part of the land, with tall trees encapsulating the back and sides, and a picturesque view of the mountains and foliage in the front. But today, again, was painfully dreary looking. And although we expected to see more buds and blossoms, the majority of the trees still remained bare. I suggested turning around to my sister, until she insisted we explored the end of the park. I thought it wouldn't hurt, so we continued forward, descended the hill, and came upon a dead end. The road was not very long, with a parking lot to the right, and one all the way at the end to the left. It was as we were going down the road that I absentmindedly glanced in my rearview mirror. The car. It had been following me distantly as to remain out of sight, but as we approached this dead end, it suddenly sprang into view. Thoughts began to flood. Who also goes to an isolated park on a rainy day? What are the chances that they're going back to the very dead end I am when there were eight to nine empty parking lots before me? And when there's nothing to do down here, who is in that car? Please be a woman and her kids. Please be a woman and her kids. Please. The entrance to the lots was the width of one car, framed by deep ditches on both sides. I kept thinking, if I pull into the lot and park, that car can block me in at the entrance. And if I try to escape another way, my car will plummet into the ditch. At this point, this is all coming out as incoherent frantic babbling to my sister. I swing into a lot, and as the car continues towards us, I quite literally floor it in a whiplash-inducing crescent and book it out of the way I came. Now, I'm creeping up the incline as this car descends, and at one point we're perpendicular, stealing a look at the individual inside. A 45-50 to 50 year old man. I frantically climbed down the hill and were now, luckily, a good distance away. The hill's elevation offers us a clear view of the car, and I instruct my sister to keep a vigorous watch as I continue driving. She reports him to pulling into the center of the last lot as if to park, remaining rather still, but still veering ever so slightly to the left, as if to turn around. I'm shaking and checking my rearview mirror obsessively as we exit the park, descending the road we initially traversed. It's when I'm nearing that very light the car tailed me from that I glance back and, in its usual fashion, the same car makes its slow, obscure approach. At this moment, my sister receives a well-timed call from my father. We inform him of the situation and he questions us but we are absolutely certain and insistent. He remains skeptical. I turn on my blinker to make a left. 
The car follows, adrenaline and panic surging. I begin racing down the road with the intent to sandwich multiple cars between us and expand the distance. I make multiple loops around my town to assure I'm safe, and this continues for a good 20 minutes. Until it works, I lose him. I have combed through sex offender registries of my town and neighboring ones and have attempted to identify his car, but no luck. I can find no trace of this man. I mentioned previously that my town is very small, so I'm always cautious on the road, especially when approaching that light at the same time of day. I haven't returned to that park since, but I am plagued with questions. What was this man planning to do? My car had a very visible parking pass of the school my sister and I attend, and I fear he intends to target us or one of the other students someday. After all, the school is not very far from that very park. Every time I see a similar car, my heart drops to my stomach. So, to the middle-aged man that trailed me for miles, let's not meet. Ten years ago, my ex and I were struggling for money and ended up moving into a cramped old flat in a 1920s hotel that had been converted into flats. We initially were offered the second floor flat, but despite being nicer, there was this air of dread in it. We both felt very uncomfortable in it, like we shouldn't be there. So we ended up taking the first floor flat. Within a month of us living there, a young girl moved in above us. She screamed, banged, and came in and out at odd hours. My ex would bang on the ceiling, and she'd stop for a bit before starting up again. We complained, and then three months later, it stopped for the most part. We still heard heavy, slow stomps on the ceiling, closing doors, and an occasional low moan. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as before, and only really happened at night, so we just gave up trying to get her to shut up. One night, we were laying in bed about to sleep when the stomping began. It started quiet before getting louder and louder until it was right above our heads. My ex lost it. He went upstairs and banged on her door. No answer. He came back downstairs and when it continued, he banged on the ceiling, shouting, Shut the hell up. We've had enough. It stopped and we finally got some sleep. The next day, I was complaining to the ground floor resident, Emma. She looked confused, then told me the girl had abandoned the flat a month ago, just up and left during the night. I told her I must have been mistaken, but my ex and I were very confused. I reported it to the landlord, who said he'd been doing minor repairs, but only during the day, and that he would change the locks in case the girl had been coming and going. Things settled for a bit, but then weird things started happening. Keys left on the side would disappear and show up in the kitchen drawer. Doors would be open when I swore I closed them. I was having mental health issues at the time, and my ex told me I must have been doing it. So I just left it. I stopped mentioning the weird occurrences because he wasn't very supportive, and he always blamed me for them. Then it happened. I was alone cooking in the kitchen with my headphones in. I remember it was stormy outside, and the wind was whipping up against the window panes. Suddenly, I got this eerie feeling that I should run, so I took out my headphones and looked into the lounge. Nothing. Still, the feeling persisted, and I felt the hairs on my arms stand up. I needed to pee, but to get to the bathroom, you had to go into the bedroom. Something told me not to go to run, but I ignored it and went to the bedroom and opened the door. It was dark, but I could plainly see someone sitting on our bed. I shut my eyes, hoping it was just tiredness or my mental issues, but no, there she was when I opened my eyes. My hand was stuck on the door handle and my whole body froze when suddenly the person started turning their head towards me. I can see her face now, grayish blue, black where the eyes should be, a mass of long black hair down her shoulders. 
and I screamed, ran out of the flat and downstairs, crying and hysterical. I banged on Emma's door and she let me in. As she calmed me, her husband went to check the flat, but said no one was there. I was too scared to go back up, so I sat with Emma until I calmed down. My ex came home and we went back up. He asked me why I was so anxious. I lied and said it was the storm. I felt I couldn't tell him. He would either laugh or say I was a psycho. I went to the doctor and told him about it, and a month later I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and given medication. I saw the woman once more in the mirror behind me, but I just shut my eyes and walked out. I told myself it was just my bipolar and that soon the meds would work. Three months later, we moved into another house. We were chatting about how happy we were to be rid of the place and how creepy it had been when my ex laughed nervously and said he hoped the woman hadn't followed us. My blood froze and I asked him what he meant. He told me that a few times he'd woken up to see a woman with a grey face and no eyes standing at the end of our bed, staring at me. He was in a bad place at the time and assumed it was night terrors. I remember one night where he woke screaming and dashed to turn on the lights. He said it was a nightmare, but he now told me it was because he'd woken to the woman lying above me, almost parallel, staring at me. As I said before, I had never told him about her. We laughed it off, but I was creeped out for a while. A few years ago, Emma popped up on my social media. We got chatting and the topic of the woman came up. She didn't laugh. Instead, she told me that she heard that the flat above us used to be rented by an elderly lady decades before who had drowned in the nearby lake just days after her husband left her for another woman. I asked her why she hadn't said anything at the time, but she said I'd been so hysterical at the time that there was no point upsetting me further. I still think about this sometimes. I've been medicated for years and manage my symptoms well. I don't really believe in the paranormal. It seems a bit far-fetched, but I still sometimes wonder whether that woman was a shared hallucination or something much, much worse. I went camping with some new friends once, and one demanded he not share a tent with anyone because he sleepwalks, after we'd already made the plans that he would share a tent with one friend while my girlfriend and I would have our own. We said whatever. I was kind of pissed off about it, but left it so we could still enjoy the weekend. My girlfriend and I shared an awkward tent with basically a random person. That night, I was woken up by my girlfriend who said, Chris's friend is freaking me out. So I looked outside the tent, and the guy is just walking in circles. I told her he sleepwalks, so we just need to keep an eye on him and make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. About 30 seconds later, he starts screaming hello at the top of his lungs, and that goes on for a while, just standing there in the middle of the campsite screaming. At this point, we're all awake and watching him like what the fuck. Then he turns towards the woods, screams hello, and points his pistol into the nothingness. Luckily, it was away from us. Now, up to this point, I didn't even know he brought his firearm, so... I went ahead and got mine out too because I was thinking like, shit, he's going to sleep shoot us, but he doesn't. Instead, he put it down, got into his tent, and went immediately back to sleep. The next morning, I asked him what the fuck he was doing. It turned out he was not asleep, and he thought he heard coyotes, so his first thought was to wander off by himself into the night instead of waking any of us up. I never camped with him again. A few years later, he made the news for scaring the shit out of an entire campsite one night because he was running through the woods and shooting his firearm erratically because he saw Bigfoot and was trying to track him down. He was a really weird guy.
This happened to me a while back. I was roughly 16 and just couldn't sleep. At 2am, I heard this loud noise that made me jump. I'd never heard a noise quite like it. The sound was a cross between a giggle and a scream. I paused my show and turned on the light. There was nothing there though. As I turned around to go back to my bed, I saw what looked like a shadow of a woman standing in the hallway. I froze. Did she see me? She began to walk towards my room, which was the opposite end to my parents' room, so I was worried that she was going to come and get me or something. As she got closer, I backed away from the door and started to go towards the left side of my bed. Next to my bedside table, I keep a bat for self-defense. I grabbed a bat and hid behind the side of my bed, praying the woman hadn't seen me. After about a minute, there were footsteps going down the stairs. I breathed a sigh of relief and got up, going back to close my door. As the door closed, it hit my toe. Now these doors were heavy, and back then I was a proper Slim Jim. I had no padding, so when the door hit my toe, I let out a quiet, shit. At that point, I realized what I had done. The lady's head whipped around, and we locked eyes. She came back up the stairs and came heading towards my room. I tried my best to shut my door, but before I could, she got her foot into it. Your father said everyone was asleep. Why are you up? My mouth opened, but words wouldn't come out. I was terrified. The lady pushed open my door, thrusting me to the floor. You were gonna forget that you ever saw me, young man, and you're going to go straight to bed. Do you understand? Suddenly, I heard my parents' bedroom door open. I shouted out, and in comes my dad. Shh. Indigo, for goodness sake. You're gonna wake up your brothers. Sandra, I thought you were leaving. I stopped for a moment. You know this creepy witch. My dad gave me the, if I could scream at you right now I would look, and told the woman to leave. You were not to tell your mother about this, Indigo. Go to bed. The next morning I woke up and figured what had happened. My dad was having an affair. My mom traveled a lot with work, so he was probably sleeping with the Sandra person every time she was away. That pissed me right off. Luckily my mom was back once I woke up, and so I thought she deserved to know. I wasn't going to tell her directly yet though. I wanted to see if I could pressure my dad into it first. So dad, fun night last night. He almost choked on his breakfast. He didn't break though. My mom asked what I was talking about, and he just said he went out with some friends for some beers, and by the time he got home, everyone was asleep. In the end, he never told her. So the next time she went away and Sandra came and slept with my dad, I told her, and they got a divorce. This happened last holiday season. It was my first Christmas with my partner, so we were hanging out and telling each other our personal and family traditions so we could do them together. I brought up hot cocoa and peppermint schnapps, and he said he'd never had it before. It's hands down one of my favorite parts of winter, so I excitedly said we had to try it and offered to go just down the street to the liquor store for a small bottle of schnapps. The liquor store is less than a mile from his house, and it has an overhang in a parking spot near the door. I was just running in quickly, so I parked there. As I got out of the car, I noticed a homeless man going through a dumpster about a hundred feet away. I didn't think much of it. It's the low California desert, and unfortunately homelessness is very common. I grabbed the schnapps and walked out of the store, but as I turned to go to my car, I saw the homeless man suddenly start speed walking right towards me. I was maybe 10 feet from my car, but at this point, so was he. I freaked out and bolted to my driver's side door, and he does the same. I jumped in as quickly as I could and slammed the door as he was getting to it, but my purse stopped it from closing all the way. I felt the door was partially latched though, 
so I hit the button that locked all the doors and quickly pulled it closed the rest of the way, just as this man started pulling on the door to open it. He was right by my window, so close I could see his bulging eyes in the dark, and he started trying to say something to me. I kept yelling no as I started the car, and I was able to get away. I haven't gone back to that liquor store since. I just don't want to meet him ever again. I recently quit my job at a fast food chain after working there almost 10 months. This story is part of the reason why I didn't want to stay much longer. I worked the drive through from 5pm to 11pm almost every weekend. Seeing regulars was not uncommon for me, and I would even memorize most of their orders and fill it out as soon as I heard their voice. Most were very polite and occasionally tipped, but on one particularly busy day, there was an unfamiliar, weary presence. I had just started my shift, so I was running food to the window. I made eye contact with the man at the window in his car and immediately felt uneasy. I brushed it off because we were busy and I had work to do. My manager set up my cash drawer. I took over drive through orders and payments and whatnot. There were lots of orders, so I wasn't paying special attention to specific voices or menu choices. But one did catch my attention. It was a low, hesitant voice asking for a sandwich. I give the man the total and he waits in line. He arrives at the window and it's the man from earlier. I assumed he just forgot to order something. Now, his car was pretty low to the ground, so he had to extend his arm out to hand me his debit card. As he does this, he mumbles something under his breath without breaking eye contact with me. I'm sorry, what was that? I question. I said, you're looking beautiful today. At this point, I'm really uncomfortable. Not only do I have a boyfriend, but I'm also underage, and I'm not interested at all. Oh, uh, thank you, I say nervously. I handed him the bag of food and quickly shut the window until he drove away. I half-heartedly complained about him to some co-workers, as we usually do with weird customers, but I still had a strange gut feeling. A little while later, when the average wait in our line was about 10 minutes, I hear a familiar voice over the mic asking for a cup of water. It was low, but agitated and forceful. I saw his face through the windshield and walked away from the window so my manager would take care of him. This happened a couple more times that day, asking for straws and other free things. At this point, I was sure that he was just trying to look at me. I was so frustrated with him and the rest of my work day that I went to the bathroom and cried. I usually have pretty thick skin when it comes to this stuff, but I was just so over it. The rest of the night went on and he didn't make another appearance. I thought I'd probably never see him again, until my very last shift at the store a few months later. We weren't busy that evening, but it was much later in the day than the first encounter. I did not recognize the voice, but I immediately recognized his face and car. I swallowed my pride and took his payment, trying not to make eye contact. I called my manager, and he said that he would give the food out for me. As suspected, the man was back in the drive through not long afterwards for a cup of water. This time I knew better. I sent a male co-worker to the window to get it for him since I was busy anyway. Once given the water, the man asked my co-worker, You guys close at 11 now, right? I was so glad I was getting picked up by my mom that night. I was constantly looking out the windows and making sure he wasn't out there waiting for me. Call me paranoid, but I listened to enough true crime to be overly cautious. I lived in a duplex for a number of years, and pretty much since day one, 
I'd hear noises like someone moving around upstairs. Only problem, we lived in a single-story building. I figured that even in the worst-case scenario, someone was secretly living in the attic. We'd be able to hear if they ever climbed down into the apartment, as they'd need to step onto a washer-dryer and open squeaky and generally loud accordion doors. One night, our daughter threw up on our bed in the middle of the night. My wife and I slept on the couch, and I hear a loud crunching sort of noise that I can't identify coming from the kitchen right in view of the couch, but I see nothing, mostly because of how dark it was. The next morning, my wife asks if I heard the sounds in the kitchen. I spend a few more nights on the couch to see if I can catch that sound again. It happens multiple times every night, and I finally catch what was making that sound. A rat had been sneaking into the kitchen and just wondering. The noise we heard was the rat entering the kitchen through a gap between wood and metal, then walking on the linoleum. After that, it all made sense, and we started noticing all sorts of other rat noises, like the one in the attic. I used to clean movie theaters. Our shifts would start at 2 a.m. On a slow weekday night, I decided to go out and pick up the trash in the parking lot. It was around 4 to 5 a.m. The theater was also next to a really busy road, so people passing by could see into the parking lot clear as day. I had headphones in and a grabby thing in my hand to pick up gross stuff when I suddenly get a call from my boss who's inside the building. She tells me that she just saw a truck pull into the parking lot and we weren't expecting any vendors today. As she says this, the truck pulls up next to me and stops as the man starts to open the door. There was a clear moment when he started to lean out and then he saw that I was on a phone call and the grabby thing over my shoulder like a baseball bat. He sees my hands, then looks up at me and says, Looks like it might snow today. He then closes his door and drives off. I'm 100% sure that if my boss didn't call me, the man would have tried to grab me and get me into his truck. I then warned everyone that no one should do the parking lot garbage until it's light out and to always be on alert. I will preface this by saying I'm not a spiritual person. I don't believe in an afterlife or past lives or souls or anything. This experience, however, was weirdly vivid and I still think about it, despite it happening years ago. I had a dream some time ago where I died. I don't remember how, but that's not the part that stood out to me. I ended up in this purgatory slash waiting room type of place, think a dentist's office, there was a lot of white. I remember one of the receptionists trying to sort me into heaven or hell, but I kept trying to tell her this was some kind of mistake and that I shouldn't be there. I explained that I couldn't be dead because my mother, who was going back to school at the time, would miss me and all her efforts to improve our life would have been for nothing. She sent me away to try and cope. I don't remember much else of the middle then, but I do remember before I woke up from the dream, the same receptionist lady placed her hand on my shoulder and said, don't let your mother's hard work go to waste. I woke up immediately after that. Like I said, I'm not a spiritual person, but if I die and wake up in some dentist's office, I would not be surprised. I used to mess around this massive property that consisted of three gigantic factory buildings right next to a big strip mall plaza. It was pretty popular because the cops never cared enough to patrol, so the whole place was completely covered in really amazing graffiti. Once our group of nine visited, just after a tropical storm that knocked out power in most of the state, we thought it'd be cool to go stargaze up on the roof. To get up, you have to crawl through this partially collapsed passageway and then climb three stories up on an old ladder. 
A few minutes after we all got up, a waterlogged section of roof started collapsing and we all had to scramble on top of each other to get down the ladder, with a few people basically falling part way down. We managed to crawl out the passageway part just as some metal parts of the roof started crashing down. We decided we probably shouldn't stick around and find out how much water damage the storm had done. We still continued to visit it for several years until the property changed hands and a security guard was hired to watch over it, but we never dared to go on that roof again and definitely never went after rainstorms. I worked on ships. There was one night I was on a ship sailing through Alaskan waters. It happened to be my first night ever seeing the Northern Lights. I can't believe how awesome that was. It made the sky clear. It made the night look like it was dusk. We were able to see clearly for miles. A few buddies and I hit the roof, or what we call it, Lido deck at 1am just to gaze at it. An hour or so in, there were six of us on top, nearly the entire crew now. A big white spotlight shines at us. We were near land, but where the spotlight was was above the water, and it wasn't low enough to be on a ship. This was very high up. It shined on us for about 15 to 20 seconds. Once the light turned off, we looked to see what it was. We saw nothing. No trace of an aircraft or anything. A couple of minutes go by and the same light shined on us. This time it was on the other side of our vessel above mountains, still unable to see what it was. We all saw it. We all have never seen any aircrafts hovering above these waters, especially at 2 a.m. We didn't know what it was. We think it might have been some sort of silenced aircraft that the military was probably doing drills or something with. But anyway, that was one of the weirder things to happen out on the ocean. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, 
Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.